Welcome. My name is Kendra Strauss. I'm the director of the Labor Studies Program here at SFU. Um, it's my great pleasure to start us off today uh, with a territorial acknowledgement. Um, so Simon Fraser University is on the unceded, stolen, and continuously occupied lands of the tsleil Squamish, and Musqueam peoples. And as we listen to David's talk today, and we reflect on issues to do with workers' rights and the nature of our capitalist economy, I think we can reflect on the ways that that economy and our positionality as workers, especially those of us who are settlers, is premised on the dispossession and ongoing colonialism that impacts Indigenous people on these lands. So the format for today is that um, Bethany is going to introduce David, and then David's going to talk probably for about 45 minutes. Um, we're then going to take some questions, and um, there will be questions both on Zoom and in the room. So I'm going to try and manage both. I hope everybody can bear with me if that doesn't go 100% smoothly. For those of you who are on Zoom, I would encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A. You don't have to wait for David to be finished speaking. Um, if you have a question uh, that comes up, you know, as you're listening, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. We may not have time to get to everyone's questions, but we will do our best. Um, and then we will, you know, try and wrap things up and be respectful of everyone's time. So thanks again for joining today, and I'm going to pass over to Dr. Bethany Hasty to introduce our guest. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Kendra. And um, so, yeah, I'm delighted to present today's speaker, uh, Professor David Dury. He's a professor of work law at York University and a senior research associate at Harvard Law School's Labor and Work Life Program. He served as academic director of Osgood Hall Law School's Specialist LLM Program in Labor and Employment Law from 2010 to 2022, and was the Canadian representative of Harvard Law School's Clean Slate for Worker Power Project, as well as the author of a leading textbook, The Law of Work, and an award-winning blog of the same name. As I understand it, Professor Dory also began his legal career here in BC practicing labor law, before returning to academia, where he's gone on to publish in labor and employment law, legal theory, global supply chains, and labor and climate change, and is here with us today to speak on the topic of the future of Canadian labor law. So please join me in welcoming Professor Dory. Well, thanks everyone for coming here. I can't believe I got people in here on Sunday morning. Um, Thank you, Bethany and um, Kendra, for having me here. Um, and so um, it's always a treat to come back here. Um, as it was just said, I did practice law here back in the late 1990s um, uh, at Victory Square. Anyone from Victory Square here? Um, I had at, one time. Well, there you go. I was at, I was at Victory Square uh, in the Middle East. Um, actually met my wife at the courthouse down the street at the call in the bar in British Columbia. Uh, she was a C and I was a D and we were sat right beside each other. So I, um, it held a special place for me. Um, and when I came here, I was already a lawyer in Ontario. So they put us in a little separate room of lawyers from other places. Uh, and uh, so I'd already, I'd already practiced a bit. I'd done a lot of hearings in Ontario, but it was still quite a shock when we got out here, sort of a legal culture shock um, when I got out of here. Things were familiar, but different in terms of the law. Um, told Jennifer this story here, but uh, no, I, I just want to throw in a little labor board anecdote because I know half the board is here. Um, that uh, on my very first hearing, uh, it was in Victoria. I took them Pelajet from around the corner here, which was a whole experience in itself. Um, got to my hearing in Victoria, and early on in the evidence, I very forcefully and, and uh, confidently objected on the rule in Brown and Dunn, uh, which is this obscure kind of evidentiary rule from, from Britain. Um, but in Ontario, at the Labour Board, they, they religiously enforced this rule. Um, and I objected. I said, and the vice chair said, what basis? And I said, the rule in Brown and Dunn. 
and nobody in the room knew what I was talking about. Uh, and he, uh, the vice chair, very politely said, Mr. Gorey, we don't concern ourselves with those technical rules of evidence here. Uh, and so I knew things were a little bit different. Uh, Paul Weiler, Professor Paul Weiler, who sort of got out here in labor law, once described the culture of BC labor law and labor law policy as tangled and turbulent. And I got a sense of that early on as I was trying to train myself to become a British Columbia labor lawyer as an Easterner. Um, but flash forward 25 years now, and a lot has changed in my life, but quite frankly, not a lot has changed in the world of labor law. Um, and the basic found, oh crap, sorry, I've got a clicker here. What? I actually hadn't moved yet. Oh. I'm about to go there. So, okay. we, <laughs> so I should click. Or you can just tell me okay. and I'll do it. <laughs> um, yeah, not a lot has changed. Uh, and um, there's been some tinkering around the perimeter, the, the periphery of the model. But the model we use across Canada and in British Columbia remains basically uh, as it was structured in the 1940s when we originally adopted it and imported it from the United States. So we tinker with things. We talk, of, you know, we change in this province. We go from car check to vote to car check to vote to car check. To, and even, it's just, frankly, it's ridiculous. Uh, the number of times that we change the rules about how we measure support for, for, um, for collective bargaining from employees. Um, but even here in BC, where the pendulum probably swings more than other places, um, the underlying core model has remained the same since the 1940s. And as this, most people in this audience will know, the core pillars of that model um, include what I've got up on the screen here, majoritarianism, majoritarianism which is the idea that uh, you only get access to collective bargaining as an employee in Canada if a majority of your coworkers also want that. Right? So this idea of majoritarianism um, that we took from the American micro model. And secondly, exclusivity. So the idea that if a majority, if a union can show a majority representation within a bargaining unit, then the government stamps a license to bargain and negotiate uh, on behalf of all of the employees in the bargaining unit, even the ones that did not want collective bargaining. So those two pillars of the model uh, were imported from the American Wagner Act of, of 1935, um, and which is why we often refer to our model as the Canadian Wagner model. Um, and it's important to add that Canadian part because uh, although the Canadian government's imported the American model, there's always been Canadian, um, unique Canadian features to it. Uh, and so, you know, they, they include, for instance, in Canada, we use the car check system for measuring employee support or, or quick votes, as opposed to the United States, where they have prolonged, months long, sometimes years long uh, fights uh, over just trying to figure out if the employees even want collective bargaining. Um, in the United States, uh, employers can permanently replace strikers. We didn't adopt that model here. We have more protections for, for legal strikers. But on the other hand, the Americans actually have a broader right to strike. I'm going to come back to some of this as we go through. But the Americans, um, uh, the American system, for example, does not ban mid-collective agreement strikes. We put that into the statute. So there are, there are important differences. There's just a couple, but there's, there's many more um, differences. Um, and uh, so we have a long history of cross-border, uh, we call it pollination, cross-border uh, learning in Canada and the United States over the years, and it goes in both directions. Right? So in the 1940s, uh, it was the Canadian labor movement uh, that was pushing for Canada, Canadian governments to adopt an American-style legislation. Right? Canadian unions wanted a Wagner, a Canadian Wagner Act. Um, and then uh, for much of the, the mid to late 20th century, um, the Americans, especially the American labor movement and, and people who were supportive of collective bargaining, really pushed to Canadianize the American model. Right? So they looked at the things that we do better here in terms of protecting, excuse me, freedom of association. And they said, well, wouldn't it be good? If we could take the little tweaks that the Canadians have, have put in and, and bring them to the United States. And leading that argument was Paul Weiler, who left here as the chair of the BC Labor Relations Board and went down to Harvard 
um, who proceeded to publish a series of papers and books in which he made the argument that um, he made the argument that um, a lot of the explanation as to why collective bargaining is doing better in Canada than the United States by the, 18, by the 1980s and 1990s can be explained by differences in legal models. Right? So Paul Weiler argued that if we could Canadianize parts of the American Wagner Act that collective bargaining, more workers in the United States would be able to unionize. And he had this powerful chart that he was able to put into his work uh, where it, it shows that, you know, at the beginning, the United States had much higher percentage of workers who were covered by collective bargaining, but that, um, you know, it started to change in the 1970s, and then Canada's unionization rate had sort of steadily gone up while the United States had steadily gone down. And he made the argument that a lot of the explanation for that is legal. Uh, uh, and so, uh, so we have on the one hand in the 1940s, we have can the, can the Canadians arguing that we should do it, we should take the American model and bring it to Canada. And then we've got decades in the late 20th century, and even to this day, although less so, but even to this day, there's a lot of this arguments from the Americans that we should take from the Canadian model and bring it into the United States. Uh, and not to give too much away, uh, but uh, I'm going to argue today that a new chapter in this nearly century long uh, cross border labor, labor law love story uh, is upon us. Uh, and that in this newest chapter, Canadians once again will look to the US uh, for inspired uh, for ideas on labor law reform to bolster fading collective bargaining here as well. Uh, now, the idea that Canadians would want to borrow from what has long been considered an inferior model in the United States might seem absurd, absurd but uh, I'm going to argue it's an inevitable outcome of the fact that Canadian private sector union density is basically following the same trajectory as the United States. We're just a couple of decades behind them. Um, and, uh, uh, and that as we continue to fall down towards 10% private sector union density in this country, uh, it's inevitable that we're going to start to look at some of the same ideas that Weiler was thinking about 30 years ago. And by the way, when Weiler was writing, uh, union density was basically at what it is now. Union density in the United States was basically at what it is here in Canada, 15%. Um, I'm talking about the private sector. All my talk, I'm focusing on private sector and labor law. Public sector has got its own issues, but I'm not going there today. We're going to focus on private sector union density. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, but I'm not gonna, I'll come back to that story as we go through. First of all, I need to set the parameters uh, for what I'm going to discuss today. This talk is called Mapping the Future of Canadian Labor Law. And the way I see it, there's basically two ways you can approach a discussion or a talk on the future of labor law. You can uh, take a normative view. In other words, you can argue, uh, here is what I think the future of labor law should be. Uh, or if you were making the rules, what would you do? Okay, that's that's one approach. Uh, the other approach, let's just say, well, the other approach uh, is to be predictive. In other words, I'm not going to argue what I think the future of labor law should be. I'm going to tell you what I think the future of labor law is going to be. Uh, those are very different things, and we often kind of merge them in, but it's important to keep those two ideas different. And now law reform reports and law reform commissions that are struck by governments are of the first type, right? They take a snapshot of the current world of labor relations, they identify problems and they propose solutions. Okay? And we have loads of these sorts of labor law commissions over the years. We can go back, we can go back before this, but I'm gonna start with the Woods Task Force in the 1960s. Uh, we've got the Sims report on federal labor law. Um, and uh, a BC Labor Law Reform Commission here in the 1990s. There's also one in the United States, uh, sorry, in Ontario in the 1990s. We go right up to the more recent Ontario Changing Workplaces Review in 2017. And then you had your own, once again, Labor Law Review here in 2018, I think, right? This is constant, right? So there's lots of these over the years. Um, and these sorts of these sorts of commissions produce reports that provide sort of roadmap as to the way a government could go if they want to. Um, 
The second approach to the study of the future of labor law is surprisingly uncommon, right? And I say surprisingly because you might think that people would be more interested in what labor law, future of labor law might look like than what some people think it ought to look like. Um, uh, so if you go looking, you'll find, you won't find a lot of writing or papers about what the, what will Canadian labor law look like 25, 30, 40 years from now? Well, you won't find that. People don't tend to do it. And maybe there's a good reason for that, right? Maybe nothing good can come of that sort of paper game. In other words, uh, you'll, you may eventually be proven wrong. Uh, you may be entirely ignored, uh, or you may be dead by the time you're proven right. So uh, you have to be some sort of button for punishment to stand up in front of people and try and predict what labor law will be in 30 years from now. Uh, this is why I'm the perfect person for this. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, what I think is coming next in Canadian labor law, not what I think should come next. Because nobody really cares what I think should, should come next. I have some ideas. Everyone in this room has some ideas, right? Uh, but I'm going to focus on this other question of where do I think we're actually going? Uh, based on everything I read in the literature. Uh, so now that we've uh, explained what I'm going to do in this talk, let me begin by uh, repeating something a wise man once said. Okay? Every century develops its own collective bargaining model, and we are a quarter way through the 21st century and still married to a model developed in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Change is coming. Uh, this is one prediction I feel confident in making. Okay? Change will come. The Wagner model is not an eternal feature of the Canadian legal landscape. I have little doubt that the labor law textbooks uh, in the year 2100 will refer to the Wagner model in the same way we refer to the master and servant law today. It will be a historic relic, something that we used in a different earlier period. Uh, but what model will replace the Wagner model and how we will make that change is really the interesting question, right? That's where we're getting into. How do we know what's coming? Well, here's something we do know, just quickly. Again, I think a lot of people in this, this won't be new to people in this crowd, most people in this crowd, but the Wagner model doesn't help most people. In fact, never has, right? Um, we know it. We just saw the chart a minute, the stats a minute ago. We're now at about 15% private sector union density. In other words, 85% of, of employees in the private sector are non union. Uh, and uh, if you work for a large employer, 500 or more people, you're in the public sector, you probably still have a pretty good chance of getting collective bargaining if you want. Not necessarily. It's pretty damn hard to organize those giant Amazon factories, but the model still works relatively well in the giant sorts of workplaces that it was designed to work on. Um, big factories, big, huge offices with hundreds of people. You can still organize those places and get collective bargaining, right? So, but for but for for the vast majority of Canadians who work in small workplaces, collective bargaining under the Wagner model is basically not a realistic option. It's not going to reach them. It never has. There's one-offs. You know, you got a Starbucks and McFlurry in your eyes. It won't last. With all due respect to my steelworker friends, uh, and I say that only in half jest, right? If you look back at the history of the unions that have organized coffee shops, they all end up in decertification for lots of stru structural reasons that uh, people in this room will know a lot about. Um, okay, so the best that can be said about the Wagner model is it did a pretty good job of what it was assigned to do, which was to control. Uh, facilitate, but mostly to control a labor conflict in giant industrial workplaces. Okay, uh, uh, but if we're interested in making collective bargaining available to everybody else, the 85 percent of other people, it's actually more than 85 percent because we're talking about employees, all right. But there's all these other people who are like independent contractors who also are excluded from the model, right? But let's say 85 percent of so people in retail, fast food, uh, home workers. Right, the new 
digital gig workers, the Uber drivers, and all that. If we want to make collective bargaining available to those people in a realistic way, the Wagner model is not going to do it. We, now, this assertion is not really controversial, right? I mean, people have been arguing this point for at least 30 years. Right? Uh, the most typical response lately about what we should do in order to expand the reach of collective bargaining you introduce develop some sort of system of sectoral or broader based collective bargaining right so the idea is uh, that instead of you know a union organizing a single Tim Hortons and bargaining a collective agreement with a single Tim Hortons franchise franchisee uh, let's have a system that allows unions to organize all Tim Hortons employees and bargain one collective agreement out, or all coffee shop employees or all fast food restaurant employees Right, one giant. So you're you're bargaining up top, and you're bargaining agreement that comes down. Right. Um, I, what I call this in a lot of my writing is ascending up from the Wagner model. Uh, so you, you the uh, Wagner model is based on you primarily on workplace by workplace collective like bargaining. Uh, when we talk about sectoral bargaining, we're talking about ascending up to a higher level industry or sector bargaining. Okay. Uh, now, I should say, uh, just I should mention the, the calls for sectoral bargaining that are quite common now. Um, and I'm saying common from people who want collective bargaining to reach more people. Right? Uh, there's an assumption in the argument that sectoral bargaining will lead those workers to be better off than, say, for example, just having a far more effective employment standards regime that's enforced. Right? Uh, now, that's an empirical question. Uh, and it might be right, it might not be right. You still have enough experience to know, right? Um, but I'm not here to debate whether sectoral bargaining is something we should do. As I told you, I'm doing the other type of talk, right? What is likely to happen, okay? Uh, and in fact, I have my doubts that sectoral or industry level bargaining will appear as a shining beacon on the labor law horizon here in any soon. Uh, well, let's talk about why that is. Uh, now, I want to start uh, because it was mentioned uh, that I worked. I had just a very small role in this Harvard Clean Slate project, right? But uh, they had representatives from different countries there. Um, and I was a Canadian rep, so I got to just go hang out in uh, Harvard and join these little meetings where they would float ideas, right? Um, and one of the things that came out of that, one of the major proposals that came out of the Clean Slate Project for reform of American labor law was sectoral bargaining. Right? So one of their proposal was um, that any time you get at least 5,000 workers in a sector or 10% of employees in that sector who want collective bargaining to join a, a union, uh, that you can apply and there would be a sectoral bargaining system set up to bargain in sector level. Okay? Now, I think it's important to understand what the Clean Slate Project was about. Okay? What they said there at the Clean Slate was, if you, the whole idea of it was, if you could design a 21st century labor law and you didn't have to worry about the political viability of the project, because frankly, labor law reform, especially progressive labor law reform, is impossible in the United States. Right? Uh, so they had to put that aside because it's the end of every discussion on labor law reform. Yeah, well, nobody's going to do that. Right? So the organizers at Harvard said, forget about that. Let's assume you could do anything you wanted. What would you do to try and improve working conditions for American workers moving forward? Okay? So they put that aside. Now, my project here today is completely different. What I'm saying is what is actually likely to happen? Right? It's a very different question. Okay. Uh, uh, so, what I want to ask is can we imagine a Canadian government enacting a sectoral, broader based bargaining scheme that, for instance, covers fast food workers? Um, and here's where I become a pessimist, uh, at least in the short to middle term. Okay. So, uh, a sectoral bargaining model applied to service sector would mark a pretty seismic change 
quite different than the normal sorts of proposals we get coming out of those commission reports, which are uh, let's go back to a car check. It's you know the, the stuff we've all seen before, replacement workers. And you know, it's, we have a whole range of things that go back and forth. But this would be different. This would be we're going to change the entire model we've used for 80 years and replace it with something fundamentally different. Okay. Uh, well, how is that going to happen? Well, there's a number of ways that major uh, law reform can take place. Okay. The one of them is through proposals that come out of these law reform commission reports that I mentioned earlier. Okay. And as I mentioned back then, uh, we've had um, lots of them over the years. All right. So we bring together experts in the field. Uh, we propose certain questions to them, and they go away and they, they consult and they write a report that has proposals in it. So maybe sectoral bargaining will come about as a result of one of these labor law commissions, but I highly doubt that. Uh, I've reviewed now, as part of some research I've been doing, uh, gone back and reviewed every single one of these labor law commission reports going back to the 1960s. Uh, and I don't have time to go through them all, but I'll just list a few things, uh, observations that I've come to by just looking at these old reports. Uh, uh, not some of them newer, some of them quite, quite old. Right? The first point is that every single one of these labor law commission reports reported to be responding to a changing workplace and a changing economy. Going back to the 60s, only one of them had the gumption to actually call it the changing workplaces review. But if you look at the problem that the commissioners were asked to solve from the government, all of them refer to the fact that the economy is changing, work is changing, and we need to address it. Okay? Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is almost every single proposal that's ever come out of these sorts of proposals um, have been relatively minor variations on the wagon. In other words, the Wagner model is said, okay, this is our model. You take that as the basis, then you just say, well, how can we change it? Um, on the rare occasion when one of these reports has considered alternative models to the Wagner Act, uh, including sectoral and broader based bargaining, the commission either rejected the models as too dramatic a change, too much of a shock to the industrial relations system, or they concluded that more research is needed and then that research is never done. It disappears okay. until the next commission comes along decades later and says the same thing. Okay. Uh, and uh, in the case of the, um, you remember the uh, the BC model, you guys are probably, those in labor law will probably remember the 1992 Bajan uh, Ready proposal for sectoral bargaining. Um, and then also the more recent in the Changing Workplaces Review, there was a proposal to require, to allow uh, bargaining uh, of multiple franchisees of the same franchise, so you could have them all technically separate employers, although they're all in the same franchise, right? Those sorts of proposals that um, you know, would have brought in a form of sectoral bargaining, quite a narrow one, um, were never implemented. So there's a nice discussion about it, but they're just not implemented, okay? Uh, and then even reforms that what we could consider are more normal variations of the Wagner model, such as things like uh, unions are entitled to a, a list of employees once they start organizing a workplace. Okay? Uh, that was something I was actually in effect in Ontario shortly, briefly, right? Um, when you have that sort of a law that's a little bit still a Wagner law, but it's, hey, that's something new. Uh, once a union starts organizing a factory of 500 people and they get up to like, you know, 100, they can apply and they get a list of the contact information of everybody. That's, that's kind of new. But the minute the conservatives got elected, they got rid of it. Okay. So it's not just about coming up with ideas and then getting them implemented. It's having the other ideas survive the next election, right? Which is a challenge. Okay. So so there's not a lot of precedent for major labor law reform coming out of these commissions. These commissions are by nature conservative. Okay? There are a couple of exceptions. I'm going to come to them in a minute. Okay, 
Now, also, by the way, we shouldn't expect major labor law reform to come about because clever people, academics, for 27 years. So we can all sit in our little offices and dream up creative ideas. Uh, academics have been arguing for sectoral bargaining and other sort of novel forms of labor law reform for decades. Right? Back in the 80s, uh, Paul Weiler and Roy Adams argued for mandatory employee works councils in every single workplace. Uh, Professor Bernie Adele floated the idea of minority unions and mandatory bargaining and a right to strike for, for minority, like people who are not in a majority union. That was back in the 80s. More recently, we're seeing people uh, propose that Canada should adopt a model that New Zealand just adopted for sectoral bargaining in, in, the, in the underrepresented um, uh, sectors, which, by the way, that model is likely to get repealed later this fall without it ever having been used. Um, which kind of makes the point I'm making. And it's not just about getting the model in in the first place, it's can it survive the next election? Uh, right, so we have all of these ideas, uh, but governments for the most part have shown no interest in these sorts of novel ideas. And I'm reminded of a comment that a commissioner of one of these labor law reform commissions uh, made to me years ago. Uh, when we were talking about uh, this idea of workplace voice, Right, the idea of you know, workers need voice in the workplace. Um, and he said, thrust it off and said, nobody gives a shit about workplace voice except a handful of academics. Right? And that sort of made the point to me that um, fundamental labor law will not come about because clever little experts came up with clever little models. Right? It does not, not how it works. Okay? Well, if major labor law reform is not going to come about out of one of these commissions, and not going to come up because come about because clever academics and clever labor lawyers come up with clever ideas, then what will cause the next big uh, uh, transformation of labor law? So far, all I've talked about is what, not, what is not likely to happen, and I promised that I would talk about what will happen. So to begin to answer that question, uh, let's look at what I believe are um, the two most significant examples of fundamental labor law reform in, say, the last 80 years, right? The first one is what we've been talking about back in the 1940s when we first adopted the Wagner. That was a significant shock to the system. That was new, right? We never had that. And then the second is the 1960s and 70s, some provincial governments started to think and started to implement province wide collective bargaining in the construction sector. Right, in certain you know, province-wide trained collective bargaining. Right? Again, very different. There we go. There's an example of a government, government's adopting sectoral broader-based bargaining. Uh, so what do those two dramatic transformative moments in labor law have in common? Well, three things stood out to me. Right? One is uh, that in every case, unions were causing havoc. In the case of the 1940s, unions were striking all over the place, record numbers of strikes. During the war, when the, 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 the employers and the governments were trying to keep uh, production going around the clock, workers were going off to strike, right? And so uh, in the case of the construction sector, uh, unions were also striking. And you know, so one trade strikes, it could shut down an entire construction project. Uh, but also unions were smart and they were targeting vulnerable uh, contractors, bargaining good deals, and then using that deal to bargain up deals at other places. So the industrial relations people call this leapfrogging, uh, leapfrogging and whipsawing, right? But the point is, for our purposes, there's a lot of stuff going on that employers didn't like under the existing model. So in fact, if you go back and look at the labor law, construction labor law commission reports in the 70s, the employers are demanding province-wide sectoral bargaining, right? The employers want it because the unions were causing havoc in their industry, right? Uh, so, so that's the second thing, right? So you've got um, militant unions, you've got employers asking uh, for change. And the other thing, and the other thing that happened is in, in both of those examples, there was already experience under a model. Right? So in, in the, with the Wagner model, some provinces had already started experimenting with a Canadian version of the Wagner model in the 1930s. But more importantly, we have the Wagner model in the United States that had already been in fact for like almost a decade, right? Everybody knew had a pretty good idea of how it was going to work, right? And in the construction sector, although there wasn't legislative 
province-wide bargaining yet. There was province-wide bargaining in some trades. Okay? They had done it voluntarily. There's been voluntary recognition there already. Part. So again, everyone had an idea of how it worked. There were still hiccups, and it took a while for it to settle. But people had a basic idea of how it was going to work. Okay. So these observations about the conditions that must exist for major labor law reform take place leads, leads me to a couple of important conclusions. First one is, if fundamental labor law reform comes suddenly, like a tsunami that sort of wipes out the Wagner law and replaces it with something fundamentally different, that law is unlikely to be about empowering workers and expanding the reach of collective bargaining. Um, it's rather more likely to be driven by employer concerns um, and more likely to be about undoing those parts of the Wagner model that empower workers and strengthen unions. Um, and we're already starting to see, you know, we've seen signs of this recently, right? So in Alberta, the UCP recently introduced a law that said employees in a unionized workplace have to opt in to pay the share of union dues that goes to non-collective bargaining activities. So this is a crack in the door towards uh, right to work type legislation, which they have in the United States. Um, uh, a couple of elections ago in Ontario, the Conservatives ran, uh, floated the idea of allowing workers to opt out entirely from the collective. If, if you're in a unionized workplace and you don't want to be in the collective, by the collective you can opt out. And then uh, they never went forward with that, but they had drafted a bill, floated it, right? Um, and then more recently, as you probably saw, Ontario Conservatives tried to opt out of, of labor law altogether and just use the notwithstanding clause as a clause of bargaining for a tool. Right? And the only thing that shut them down was a mass threatened uh, national strike. Right? I think the provincial one, but certainly some unions from out of Ontario also got involved. So the reality is, and this should come no surprise to the, this audience, it's much easier from a political perspective for conservatives and those who are not that keen on expanding collective bargaining to weaken collective bargaining rights than it is for a progressive collective bargaining loving government to suddenly expand it through a new model for the simple reason that the business community will usually be less hostile and will actually often welcome laws that weaken collective bargaining. So any attempt to dramatically extend collective bargaining will be met with a huge business battle, backlash, threats of mass job losses, disinvestment. We've seen it so many times, right? This is just the political reality of uh, labor law reform. Now, the second major observation that I take from our history lesson here is that uh, uh, a precondition of major labor law reform is the militant labor movement, historically speaking, okay? Stronger collective bargaining laws have never come about at a time of labor weakness, right? or out of some sudden recognition by the governing party that they, we need to expand collective bargaining rights to people who have never had it before. Labor laws do not build collective power, they respond to labor power, historically speaking. Uh, and we just witnessed the, um, the labor movement, as I said, come together to push back against the use of the notwithstanding clause. That's an important moment in labor history. Uh, and if I was a labor leader, uh, and right now, I would be really working hard with my other labor leaders to create a sort of quick fire response that could be pulled out anytime a government starts to legislate back labor rights. But we don't, I don't know if that will happen. I don't know whether the cold, whether that response to the notwithstanding clause is a one off or sort of the beginning of a you know, movement towards greater militancy in the Canadian labor movement. I don't know what to see. Okay, so let me sum up where we are so far. I've argued that a fundamental transformation of Canadian labor law will not eventually, uh, oh, sorry, will eventually come, but that because uh, the Wagner model is not going to last forever. But I've also argued that a fundamental change won't come anytime soon, uh, at least not one that is aimed at extending collective bargaining rights to people who have been excluded historically. More specifically, I've expressed doubt that a fundamental change will come in the form of sectoral top-down broader based bargaining um, because fundamental labor law reform only happens in this country when labor is so disruptive that employers are on side. Uh, and right now, uh, uh, there's not a movement. There's not, there's no pressure in the fast food industry for employers to 
sort of come to the government and say, we, we need some help here. Okay? Uh, so we've had proposals to legislate sectoral bargaining in the fast food industry where workers are low paid, uh, union density is low, but I have said basically that those proposals aren't likely to go anywhere uh, because there's no appetite, no pressure on employers to, to compromise. There's no mass strikes in the Canadian fast food sector. Um, there's no present labor relations problem um, in need of a solution. Sure, if you're a fast food employer right now, uh, the wagon law works just fine for you because the reality is it's probably never going to lead to your workers unionized. Right? Uh, okay, so far, uh, my talk's been pretty uneventful in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, frankly, nothing's happened. Right? So uh, we're nearing the end. I need to build towards a season ending cliffhanger to my talk. So here we go. Uh, oh, wait, I had a. <laughs> uh, okay. What if something happened that disrupted the service sector and made employers reconsider the extent to which they um, believe the Wagner law is working? And what if the law played a role in creating that disruption? Uh, so we now come to the part of the talk where I'm going to engage in the dangerous exercise of trying to predict the next big event of law reform that's uh, coming to Canada. Uh, and my prediction is, is that the next big change will not come from a uh, legislative model intending to require employers to bargain at the sectoral level, but instead, change will come. Uh, the change that's going to come is going to be focused much lower down the labor relations food chain uh, on non-union workers, uh, set that up, on non-union workers who want to engage in collective bargaining or collective activity in some form, but under existing law, they have no protections at all. I think there's a looming crisis in Canadian labor law, and it relates to the ginormous disconnect between what the Charter of Rights and Freedoms is supposed to make available to all Canadians uh, in terms of freedom of association and the real world experience of the vast majority of Canadian workers. And I think that disconnect is going to come to an end. It's coming to a head. Uh, the interesting question is what's going to happen. Uh, and to make my point, I want to refer to a couple of cases. Now, Jennifer heard me do a talk a few years ago where I was still re where I referred to these cases. I love these cases. Like one of them is from way back in the 1990s, right? Uh, the other one's more recent, okay? But to me, especially that first case, uh, so much buried in there that's going to explode. Uh, so let me just quickly tell you what happened okay, in both of these cases, right? The first one, by the way, note, because this is important, both of these cases involve uh, women, uh, uh, women workers, in sort of lower pay. Now, one of them is law clerks, so they're a bit better paid, right? But, but uh, women workers uh, who do not have, they're in jobs that there's just formal collective bargaining is never going to be. Right? So what happens? Well, in the first one, uh, Algoma and Mini World, Mini World is like a, ch a child care, a daycare center. Uh, the workers decide amongst themselves that, they, you know, maybe we should, there's some things we're not too happy with, we're going to go talk to the employer about them. So they send a spokesperson in and say, we, we as a group would like to talk to you about our working conditions. The employer fires her, spokesperson. The other workers get angry at this, and the next day they show up with picket signs out front. The employer fires all of them. Okay. Um, the second case, uh, Burton versus Aronovich, Macaulay is, is newer. But again, what happens is the, the bunch of female law clerks decide that they're unhappy with the compensation system. They choose a spokesperson. She goes in, says, "You know, can we talk to you about our, our, our the way you guys do compensation?" The boss says, "Why are you talking about compensation with your coworkers?" Fires her. Uh, now she files a wrongful dismissal lawsuit, and she was just about how much notice she should have gotten, right? But what I'm interested in these sorts of cases, these facts here, I just got two, there's probably a bunch from across the country. They're hard to find. And I'm sure a lot of this goes on and nobody complains. Right? So they never make it to a case, right? But the point, what's important about these cases is you've got non-union workers, they try and act collectively, they are fired. 
then the question becomes, how does the law deal with this? Okay. So the women in Algola had a very clever union side labor lawyer who brought a sort of test case to the labor board and argued that when you fired the first woman for raising a collective, you know, talking to you about collective issues, uh, collect, start talking to you collectively about work-related issues, and then when you fired a bunch of her colleagues for protesting that, you committed an unfair labor practice in violation of the Ontario Labor Law. Okay. Um, the employer responded to that and said, this isn't covered at all by the labor relations legislation. Because, why by the way, they got, they got like half the BC labor board adjudicators. What's the employer's argument? Is there any law students here? Sorry, <laughs> pretty least but you guys. Although, I, okay, well, I want to do Socratic method for this group. <laughs> but anyway, so the employer argues labor relations legislation doesn't apply. Why? Put it in a nutshell. There's no union in your story. This has nothing to do with unions. Right now. Uh, why does that matter, right? Why does why does it matter that there's no union in the story in either of these stories, right? Well, the answer is when we go back in history again, when, when we adopted the Wagner Law, we imported it in the 1940s, uh, we dropped a crucial element of the National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, uh, which is a standalone right to associate. That's in Section Seven of the NLRA. What Americans call the well, well, the statute actually calls the right to engage in concerted activities. Okay? We can just call it the right to associate. Right? The NLRA in the United States has a standalone section that says every worker has a right to associate right? or the right to engage in concerted activities. Uh, we dropped that in the 1940s and we replaced it with a much narrower right to engage in trade union activities. Okay? Now, at the time, nobody noticed and nobody cared. Right? In fact, I've gone back and I've looked at reports that were put out in the 1940s uh, comparing the Canadian legislation to the American legislation. None of them even mentioned this. It never occurred to any of them, experts, writing that this even mattered, that the American one says a right to engage in certain activities, and the Canadian one says a right to engage in trade union activities. And that really isn't all that surprising when you realize that it isn't until the 1960s where the Americans even realized that their right to engage in concerted activities applies to non-union as well as union. That's when the Supreme Court of the United States ruled in a case called Washington Aluminum, where similar to my story, my cases, right? A bunch of workers got cold in the workplace, or would it turn the heat on? So they walked off and they were fired. Right? And we learn in that case that in the United States, it doesn't matter the non-union. Uh, they have a right to engage in conservative activity over work-related issues. When you strike, you're protected. Non-union uh, workers are protected. Okay? Okay. Yep. In response to your Socratic method, we have a question in the Q&A okay. from J.D. Uh, were S2D rights raised in these cases? No. Because, no. I'm going to come to that in a second. Okay. I'm going to do it on time. You didn't okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I'll come back to that. Good question, though. To me, it's the most important, one of the most important questions that I'm going to come to. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so nobody noticed, really didn't become uh, or even aware in the United States that Section 7 is important. Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act uh, is important to non union workers uh, until the 1960s. But even then, it really the significance of this only recently has started to become obvious in the United States, right? Uh, because um, when private sector union density in the United States is now, does anyone know what it's at, by the way? Want to guess? 8%? 8 to 5. Like the United States is basically a non union country, right? Uh, They've still got some powerful unions, but statistically speaking, 95% of private sector workers are non union in the United States. Well, when you're in that situation, when 95% of people are not in a union, how the law deals with non union collective activities becomes really important. Right? 
So when we see on the news, if any of you notice, like uh, cross country mass uh, fast food strikes, you know, they're fighting for a $15 minimum wage, right? McDonald's workers going off on strike, right? Amazon workers who are non union going off on strike, right? All of that stuff, a lot of the big labor activity that we're reading about in the newspaper, it's, it would all be illegal here. It's all non union workers. When I say non union, I mean, uh, two things, right? One, either there's no union involved whatsoever, like in my two cases, right? Or there is a union, but it's not certified. They don't have a majority, right? They just, they represent like 20% of people, right? In the United States, if those people strike, they're covered by the unfair labor practice provisions, right? Um, so it has become very important. Uh, ben Sachs, who's the Harvard labor law professor who ran Clean Slate, uh, he has written that in the United States, for most workers, all that matters is the Section 7 right to engage in concerted activity. It's all that matters. It's the only law that has any relevance to any of them. Okay. Now, uh, Paul Weiler, whenever I'm in Vancouver, I like to talk about it. Uh, Paul Weiler knew uh, the importance of the right to strike for non union workers even back in the 1980s and 1990s, when he was writing about how to save American labor law, right? One of the things he proposed is that the right to strike in the United States should be Canadianized. Remember I said he wrote a lot about how we could Canadianize? One of the things he said is, uh, in the United States, right now, workers who strike can be permanently replaced, which basically means, this is a weird distinction for Canadians to get their head around, but basically what it means to be permanently replaced is uh, the employer, when you go off on strike, the employer can hire someone to replace you and they don't have to fire that person in order to let you come back to work, right? Um, but it, you're not technically fired because if a vacancy comes up, they have to offer it to you first, if you follow, okay? Uh, whereas in Canada, our laws require the employer to get rid of the replacement worker. If replacement workers are allowed at all, you've got to, the, the striker has a, a, first, a first right of return. Okay? It's a major difference, right? So Weiler said, in the United States, one law that should change that would be Canadianized is to do what they do in Ontario, which is for the first six months of a strike, the striker has an automatic right to return to the job, okay? Now, he wrote that, right? If, but you have to understand what he was saying there. That would apply to non-union workers too, because the law already covered non-union workers. So Weiler, when he was thinking about how do we stop the fall of union density, which at the time was at 15%, it was now, how do we stop this fall? One of the things we should do is make sure that non-union workers who have a right to strike can get their job back within six months. In other words, a protected right to strike for non-union workers is one of the things that Paul Weiler argued with the state's union. Now, interesting enough, when he at the same right on the same time, he just finished writing the BC Labor Code. Right? And he was BC, he thought of all this. He's really bored about the writing of the BC Labor Code, right? In that, he never said we need a right to concerted activities in, in, in Columbia. At the time, he didn't think it was necessary, right? Because he was focusing on the operation in the, in, in the factories and the big mines, right? We do a lot of discussion of how do we encourage broader based bargaining in the, uh, you know, in the service sector in the 1970s when he was thinking about these things, but he was, he was keen to it by the time he was looking at the United States by the 1980s and 90s. Okay, so now let me bring this back to Canada and the future of labor law. I do believe the right to associate, the right to engage in certain activities coming to Canada. It's the next big thing. It's what's coming next. Uh, and uh, I know that, well, I don't know it, I feel it for a number of reasons. One is um, I've, I've had policy people from governments call me and sort of call me, call me and so let's talk about that. So I know what he's thinking about, right? And it's been proposed in a couple of these reform provisions. We should think about an American style right to engage in certain activities. But so one way it may come in is the government just put it in, bring it in. Uh, but it also seems to me that we're just one test case away. Now I'm coming to the question. We're just one test case away from the courts getting 
Uh, and I want to look out for that case. And then you see it, please. I mean, I mean, go back, it could be Algoma, except that's from the 1990s before uh, the before uh, our Supreme Court of Canada had said that Section 2D freedom of social protects a right to collective bargaining strike. Those case, case predates, predates that, right? Uh, but let's consider again those daycare workers. Okay? Uh, uh, what if a case like that came to our esteemed colleagues today? I can't believe it happened in the room. <laughs> so I was expecting an answer, right? I saw an experiment. Uh, and so what's happened is you've got a bunch of non-union workers. They raise it. They come to their employer as a, as a group. They haven't even thought about it. It's not, they, haven't, they didn't know they could. They're just not informed, right? They just said, you know what? We're not really happy. They fire, right? Now, and then they go off on strike. To protest the firing, right? And they come, they file an unfair labor practice at the BC Labor Relations Board. Uh, and the BC Labor Code says everyone has a right to engage in trade union activity. It's illegal to discriminate against someone for engaging in trade, trade union activities, just like every other statute across the country. Okay? Comes to the Labor Board. Okay? And the Labor Board decides that the BC Code does not protect these workers, um, doesn't cover non-union workers who raise collective concerns and then go off on strike um, when they don't like the answer. Uh, because only uh, employees who, who do that through the vehicle of a trade union are uh, And they didn't do that. Uh, and even then, only employees who are in a majority certified union or volunteer recognized union majority union who have gone through all the hoops that we go through in Canada to get to a legal strike position, uh, only those people are le are legally protected if they go on strike. Okay. Um, so we can't we, got, we can't help them. Right? Imagine that's what the decision. Now, what that means in practice is that our daycare workers are simply covered by the common law, right? which means they can be fired for raising collective concerns. They can certainly be fired for going on strike. Uh, uh, now that is it could be or probably is the right decision. Labor board would make in that case. You can make an argument that maybe what was going on here was really a embryonic trade union activity. Like I've heard those arguments. To me, I, I don't think. Sure, you can expand trade union activity to mean activity where there's no one who was even thinking about a trade union. You can do that, right? I, I'm suspicious that that's the right answer. Uh, but anyways, now here's the thing. So so they lose. The labor board doesn't, the labor code doesn't protect them. That raises an interesting question to me. Uh, oh, I forgot to keep going. Wait, did I? I lost track. Oh, yeah, I think we're here. Uh, if the right to strike is an indispensable component of meaningful collective bargaining in Canada, as the Supreme Court of Canada has said it is, and collective bargaining is protected by Section 2D, freedom of association in the Charter, because it is the way that workers can better match the power of the employer, then how can we have a system in which daycare workers can be fired simply for asking their employer to talk to them as a collective? Right? And, and, and then they go on strike and they're not protected. In other words, how can we say we have freedom of association if you can be fired for associating? 85% of workers, right? There's a problem there in language and application. Uh, and to me, this whole scenario raises um, an under-inclusive barter type bargain. Now, now, for those of you who aren't labor lawyers, I don't want to go too deep into the woods here, right? Uh, but um, the absence of any protection at all, I don't even know what my next slide is now. I've lost it. There you go. <laughs> the absence of any protection at all for non-union workers who act collectively may now substantially interfere in the ability of these workers to engage in freedom of association. That's the test we know from a case called Dunmore, where the court said sometimes the failure of a government to legislate protections for workers can violate the charter. If absent any protections, it's in basically in the, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be impossible. Basically, it's 
you know, they're never going to be able to exercise collective bargaining rights unless they have some protection. Um, so the question for me now is, does the fact that non-union workers who do anything collectively can be fired and nothing protects them, if that's the decision, can you then bring a charter challenge against that decision? About, against the under-inclusivity of our labor legislation and not protecting anyone who acts collectively other than through the vehicle of a trade union. To me, this case is just sitting there waiting for someone to argue it. Um, and uh, okay, I'm going to try to wrap up here. Okay. So all of this is to say that for me, regardless of how um, the right to associate comes to Canada, uh, whether it's through the government system introducing it, whether it's through charter litigation uh, in some way, I do believe that change is coming. And with it, uh, all sorts of questions arise about the future of our model. Right? So if we have a right to associate or we have a right to engage in concerted activities in Canada, uh, what does it mean? What's the scope of that right? What does it cover? Uh, does it impose obligations on employers? Right? So for example, to engage in a meaningful dialogue with a minority union, for example. Uh, in other words, a union that represents some, but not all, not a majority of workers. Um, does it protect the right to strike? But to me, this is a huge pending issue. The right to strike of non-union workers is something we're going to have to figure out after the right to strike became a constitutionally protected right. Uh, and other questions. In other words, I think that the right to associate is coming. One way or another, it's coming. And then that's going to provoke a dialogue that raises a whole bunch of interesting questions about the direction that we are moving in the future. And one of the things, you know, I'm wrapping up soon. In theory, it's possible to imagine this, what comes out of all of this, um, eventually leading to the sort of havoc in fast food sector, for example, of the sort that I mentioned earlier would be necessary in order for us to really start thinking about serious, seriously about uh, sectoral level bargaining. Right? Uh, we can imagine fast food workers in Canada uh, starting to annoy the employers, going off on little strikes, minority strikes, mass walkouts to uh, about you know to complain, like they're being in the United States, in other words, but in Canada. And imagine that uh, because of the history of the way Canada's work, our right to strike of the non our right to engage in concerted activities, it's similar to the US, but different. Maybe our courts and our legislators have actual a, a, a protected right to strike. So you can't permanently replace a non-union worker who goes off on strike about working conditions, you know, as long as they meet some condition, they have to give notice to them, right? Uh, but the point is, this is an agitation. It's a new little virus put into the Canadian industrial relations system that's been pretty much stale for 80 years, and we don't know what's going to happen, right? I think there's a lot of, Things I don't know what's going to happen. I'm just saying, I think this is coming. And really, what we need to start thinking about is what it would mean in the Canadian context. Uh, because it, to me, it opens up a whole bunch of questions. Okay. So, um, just to wrap up then, uh, the introduction of a freestanding right to associate or engage in concerted activities that I think is coming. Uh, there's no, by the way, I should say this, no guarantee of a utopia for workers. Like all we have to do is look to the United States to see. I, I, I'm not, I'm not advocating. Remember what I'm doing? I'm predicting what I think is going to happen, right? It's a whole other discussion about whether whether this will end up being a good thing for workers or not, right? Just to, again, not to go off, but for the real like the, the expert people who spend their whole lives in labor law. The Agricultural, the Agriculture Employees Protection Act in Ontario, Bethany knows, actually already pretty much has a right to associate in it, right? But it's actually a much weaker form of collective bargaining than the Labor Relations Code and the Relations Act, right? So just because this, I think the right to associate is coming to Canada, it, I'm not saying that this is going to be a great thing for workers. It may not. It could be. It may not be. It, uh, that's the question, right? Uh, but if you were to ask me, as I was kind of asked, 
to talk about what's the future of labor law, at least in the near term. Uh, I could talk about smaller things, like, for instance, I think one of the things that's going to come down the pipes is a right to engage in a digital ticket line. Uh, we need to start thinking about that. I could go through those sorts of sort of micro little variations on the wagon line. But more fundamentally, if you ask me what's the future of labor law, I would say um, that we need to look downwards. Right? We're spending a lot of time right now thinking about ways to ascend up that world bar. It's good. I mean, yeah, I've had those discussions. I'm just not confident we're going there anytime soon. Where the real action is going to be, in my view, is down. Descending down from the Wagner Act, the Wagner model of majority trade union rights and exclusivity. To me, the, the next big fight or development is down here, sort of at the individual right to act collectively. Uh, I think that's coming. And I think uh, we should watch carefully what happens when it comes, um, which I predict will happen sooner than you might think, uh, either through legislation or through a court challenge. I think I'll just stop there. Great. Thank you. So I have three questions already online, but maybe what I'll do is just do a quick scan and see if anybody here in the audience has any questions. And in the meantime, I'll stop our screen sharing. Question. Okay, so why don't we take one question from the floor and then we'll go to our questions online and that will give everyone else a chance to think of whether they have any other questions. Go ahead. Thank you for that. That was a, a very uh, interesting, compelling argument about freedom of association. I think you're probably right. Um, hope so. Um, but one aspect of your talk that I was thinking about was in, in the lead up to it, you were talking about uh, how labor law changes change with the, uh, the type of government in place, and it goes back and forth. But I was thinking about the uh, changes to uh, what unions call anti-scab legislation, uh, preventing replacement workers during strikes, and in, and the the uh, importance of precedent for these kind of things. Like in British Columbia, that was brought into place in the 1990s because there was a precedent in Quebec. But interesting, given what you're talking about, is that it stayed in place when the Liberals were in power here, and it's still in place today. So it, it was not one of those ones that was a, a back and forth. And in fact, now it's 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 mooted federally because of the, the deal between the NDP and the Liberals that it'll be expanded to federally regulated workers as well, because there's these precedents at the provincial level. So um, what do you make of that in terms of your your other argument that these these changes are can often be sort of partisan. Right. Yeah. I mean, I put uh, I put the replacement worker uh, issue into the category of what I would call tweaks to the wagon model. Right? Uh, in other words, they don't challenge it doesn't challenge the the majority exclusive. It's it's a feature uh, about the way in which power is balanced within the Wagner model. And there's certainly, that's one example. Uh, and there are other examples, you know, uh, that sort of change uh, hold, holding. So in Ontario, for example, uh, the Conservatives in the 1990s brought in mandatory votes over card check. And that stayed through liberal governments. Right? Like if the NDP came in, I'm sure they would change it. Uh, but the liberals just left. They changed a whole bunch of other things, uh, swung the pendulum back, but they just said, we're going to leave the vote. And that seems to have now just become embedded into the Ontario system. So there are examples like that. Uh, you know, the, but you'd have to go, so DC has its own history. You, you may know it better than I do, right? But, uh, why that stayed, right? Uh, but there's politics, right? And, you know, People in this room would certainly know better than I do, but I suspect that governments have just made a decision that changing it now would cause more tension and turmoil, and it works relatively. Employers aren't going losing their mind about it. There's fewer strikes. There's been fewer strikes by far because uh, the, the the balance is there that you know the employer is not able to bring in replacement workers in a strike, and so they'd rather 
Yeah. Metal. Yeah. But like for my larger point though, um, yeah, there within the Wagner model, there are there are changes that are made. There are but I don't like the introduction of a uh, ban on the replacement workers is not a fundamentally new labor law. Right? It's a tweak within it, right? It goes back and forth, right? What I'm really focusing on today is how do you move to a fundamentally different model uh, that will change? Like, I would just look at New Zealand. Uh, there was so much fanfare about their uh, sectoral bargaining model that would allow fast food workers to sort of bargain one sector collective agreement. Everyone around the world that's in support of collective bargaining was saying, look what they're doing in New Zealand. We need to do that here, right? And then, you know, I called just uh, getting ready for this. I called my friend, labor law professor in New Zealand, because only one. Uh, <laughs> so, what's actually happened? He said, well, nothing's really happened. It's looking like it's going to get repealed in the fall uh, because the, once the prime minister stepped down, it looks like the other side might be able to win. And they've already promised if we're elected, we're repealing it, right? So, it's just like, let's say the, you know, the NDP in Alberta, they could get elected. They, maybe they're going to bring in sectoral bargaining. Great. But Will it survive when they're booted out, right? And you need to have the one of the main points is you really kind of need to have the employers in this discussion, right? There's not a lot of examples of labor law coming down that really benefits collective bargaining, and, we'll, and the employer said, like, that's terrible. We're gonna, like, it's gonna kill us, and it's it's managed to come through and stay, right? And that's kind of where we're at now, right? What would it take? It's the thing I'm trying to get at. What would it take to get franchisees? To say this model screwing us too, maybe we could actually be better off if we had a system of labor law that had less chaos, right? But right now there's no chaos for franchises. System is working pretty good for them. So if you ask them, should we have sectoral bargaining? They say absolutely not. So I'm going to go to the online. So first of all, one of them is an online comment from Aaron saying, having filed multiple Section 7 board charges in multiple states, I think it's really important to stress that it is in essence a right that cannot practically be exercised versus the protection against replacing strikers, which is widely, and then it's the word endive, which I think is a typo. <laughs> um, does that make sense? <laughs> um. I'm not sure I followed it. Um, if, if the point is that uh, in the U.S. Section Seven is more, uh, as it applies to non-union workers, yeah. is more, uh, you know, it's it's not as good as it sounds. Right. In other words, I get the sense that's what it's you're more getting. paper yeah. tiger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that. And that's why in the context of talking about it within the Canadian context, it becomes interesting because we have history of stronger remedies. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, if we brought in a right to engage in concerted activities in Canada, would our culture of having more effective remedies for unfair labor practices remain? In which case it would be like, a much stronger version of the American right to engage in concerted activities. But if it, if it just came in like the American one and the employer could just fire everyone, you, you know, sure, it's a violation of it, but good luck. Uh, here's a few bucks. Then that would not be that helpful, right? That's why I say that there's all these questions. What would it mean? How would it work? What would it actually, you know, how would it fit into the Canadian system? So Don has a question. Is the same predictive solution, so what you're predicting, I'm trying to make sense of this question as I read it, the same treatment to public sector unionized return to work orders. So for teachers, transit, healthcare, or other designated emergency services. So I think what they're asking is, can something similar be applied in the case of return to work orders? Uh, because of presumably because of political mobilization and labor mobilization against them. No. You're talking about back to work legislation? Return to work work. I, I assume that's what they mean. Yeah, because we're talking about so unionized. Well, I mean, we're already, we're already dealing with back to work legislation within a charter context now, yeah. right? So that presumably would just continue. You know, is it a violation of your freedom of association to mm -hmm. order people back to work? 
because they're passing legislation um, to bring people back to work and challenge that as a charter challenge. I don't think that would change by anything I'm saying. Uh, unless I misunderstood the comment. Yeah. No, I don't think you did. So one last question um, from Noah regarding the Igloma type cases. Have you seen or heard of a case using the Charter Freedom of Association section to protect non-unionized government workers? I have not. Right. Um, but that's, you know, that's why I said I'm focusing on private sector mm -hmm. in this lecture. But of course, there's always, yeah, the charter applies directly to the government workers, right? So a bunch of well, you say I haven't, I mean, there's a whole bunch of interesting things happening in the public sector. One of my favorites is that, um, you know, lawyers are excluded from collective bargaining legislation in, in Ontario. And so OPSU is just going around organizing all the, all the lawyers. And every time the employer says, wait a minute, lawyers are excluded, they file a charter challenge. And then the employer pays because they don't actually want that case being argued, right? Uh, so uh, that's not really addressing the point there, right? But yeah, no, I'm not aware of case of a bunch of non-union public sector employees, but I would love to find that case uh, to, 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 you know, not for me to bring it to but for someone to, to argue it. Sure. Okay, we have two questions from the floor, three questions from the floor, four. <laughs> we may not have time for anyone, but I think maybe we'll take the first two at the back, in the back row, so Denise first, and then, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, so we'll take those two. Give David a chance to respond, look at the time, and then we'll take a few more from the, the next row down. So Denise, you go first. So maybe this is a bit more of a comment than a question, but it seems to me that when employers would want this, when they want sectoral bargaining, for example, is when they perceive there's an unfair playing field between their competition and there's a shortage of workers. So essentially what we're seeing right now from gig work companies is that they are demanding the government sectorally bargain for those workers so they can they can compete with the other companies and also they can try to retain workers within that model um, who might otherwise leave for other forms of employment. So, I mean, I'm working a lot in the gig work area right now and trying and working with workers who want to improve their rights. And so leaving aside the issue of misclassification and whether they should or shouldn't be um, employees to start with, I do think that there may be some interesting movement that could happen in that area because of the pressure both on the employers and the demands from the workers up. Um, and there, although there are, we'll say, some unionization in the sector, our union affiliation, there is no majority unionization in the sector. Yeah, and so there's a there's an area where I think this stuff could matter. And so one of the first things I worked on when I was a lawyer way back in the eighties was a big campaign to organize taxi drivers in, in Toronto. Um, and you know, to me that Uber stuff's not much different than the taxi drivers. It was just the, the way to get their calls instead of this dispatch radio, which now is falling, right? But um, you know, but um, the unions won those campaigns, uh, got certified. They're all found independent contractors. Mm -hmm. they, they won. Um, but they're huge. They're all decertified now. There's huge problems in servicing those bargaining units, right? And it'll be even harder with the Uber because at least the taxi drivers, you knew who was driving most of them. You know, somebody knew who the driver was. Uber's employees come and go every day, right? You know, who's in the bargaining unit and who's servicing. But what if, uh, you know, so but in that context, let's say like, you know, I don't know, 20% of Uber drivers just go on strike. That, does, it, does it have any effect at all on them? Like, I don't know how you run a strike for Uber. That's to me one of the big questions, right? But right now, if they're not employees and they all decide to, you know, strike, you're in now in antitrust problems and competition law uh, that, needs to be sorted out, right? But assuming they're employees, um, they're they're like our Goma people, right? They, you know, so they would be interested in, and then if you can cause, you know, you can get a union of Uber drivers, uh, of gig worker drivers that starts randomly striking or causing havoc, then yeah, you're now in a discussion, well, okay, we need a system to stop this, right? And, so that's all going to play out 
I didn't ask a question. I didn't give you a yeah. question. Okay, question back here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Derek. So I'm lay counsel for the TSSU, which is holding a strike vote. You might have seen downstairs. Um, teaching support staff union. We're independent uh, union uh, here. Um, and represent teaching assistants and research assistants, at least in our view. Um, interestingly enough, so we may be putting the uh, particular, an interesting flavor of your test case to test soon because we are uh, taking a strike vote, but is a strike vote of uh, bargaining unit members who have a collective agreement and voluntary recognized folks who SFU has argued are not um, bargaining unit members, um, are covered by the labor code. We are taking a vote and will be you know, expected to be positive and be going on strike soon, right? So that will be a very, um, I think, an interesting, uh, different flavor of that because we are a union. Those folks are uh, workers in our view, and they are, uh, but they are not covered by the code. I think uh, the employer would do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so they will uh, keep you posted maybe. Um, and uh, I guess maybe could you speak at all because to ask you a question about like uh, how that you know, sort of, uh, in a non say non union if a union decides to represent people um, how that might play into the freedom of association if they engage in concerted activity is that different from um, if it's they're just non union individuals uh, engaging in concerted activity? Well, I mean, right now, unless the union gets a majority and is certified or voluntary recognition, they have no rights. I mean, the only difference is if they're fired; these people are fired with joining a real union. And the code applies to the firing. They can, you know, access the unfair labor practices. Whereas in the Algoma case, they can't. They're, they're not engaged in any sort of trade activity. I should say, by the way, that in the Algoma case, what happened is um, it settled, first of all, so it never got decided. Um, but the labor board had to deal with a, a and the case itself was a preliminary uh, case. The union had to show that. There's at least an arguable case that the Labor Relations Act applied. And the Labor Board said, this is a really interesting problem. Um, but thankfully, I don't have to answer it because all I have to say is it's at least arguable that a group of workers who have never spoken to a union who are fired um, could argue that that is captured by trade union activities. And the, and the vice chair said, it's at least arguable. And then case settled, right? Uh, so, you know, we're still waiting for a case uh, where someone has to figure this out directly. I'm a little surprised it never has been argued, right? It, I mean, it takes a lawyer, I suspect a lot of time they've just been told, well, it doesn't cover you. They don't they're just gone. Okay, I think we have time for two are relatively quick questions, if possible. Oh, okay. Um, I think there are also some economic factors that can enter the analysis, maybe parallel to what you've done. Um, traditional heavy unionization has been in the resource sector and manufacturing, where the firms are competing in the same market, same price for lumber, uh, auto parts, whatever. In carrying this over to the service sector, like fast food, it's dispersed between big cities, small cities, and towns. So we're unlikely to see sectoral unionization or bargaining because in the small town, the cost of living is much lower, and also the ability of customers to pay for that hamburger is not what it is, say, in downtown Vancouver. And that, I mean, we might predict possibly uh, some unionization for a sector in the highly urbanized area, but they're going to have resistance from the franchisees in the lower cost areas where their market, they can't charge the same thing. And and the workers are willing to come with less pay because their housing costs are a fraction of in the city. Yeah, I mean, it, it got, you know, different models are, are floated, but a lot of them do work in recognition of that fact. So you can have, uh, you can have different rates for different areas uh, that are somehow tied to the mm -hmm. consumer price index or something like that. Because the unions don't want people to be put out of work. 
but you can have yeah a different rate for the cities, uh, and there's no reason that can't be bargained at a central table. Like collective bargaining, once you get there and get the people, it's quite it's quite versatile. Right? You can sort out those sorts of problems, but it is a real problem. Yeah, sure. If you had bargaining for the whole province of Ontario, and you know it's just a bunch of unions in Toronto. This is in a way, you know, we're in a time, but in your, your BC model, the beige and ready model, uh, the idea was you would have bargaining in, in a geographic area. So all, all coffee shops in the city of Vancouver. You would have that. And, and then when they when the Ontario changing clerk workplaces review people considered that type of model, they were concerned, they said it. it you can't see how it can work because one of the problems you need to figure out is how do you stop the bigger franchises from just agreeing to a wage that they know would kill the smaller businesses, right? Like how do you create credit, stop predatory bargaining? When you put competitors into the same single collective agreement, you have to think this through, right? So there's problems with it. Can you? Yeah, um, law is not my area, but I teach in the labor studies program. And so my question is about the domestic workers. Um, so uh, the labor law doesn't uh, protect them. Then what about like uh, uh, the human rights code? Well, if there's a human rights angle to it, you know, then you would have human rights angle, right? So there are, there are, like, there are some scenarios where uh, existing statutes would catch them. So if they were firing people because of their ethnicity, then you have a human rights complaint. But if they're just firing them because they had the audacity to come in as a group and say, you know, we need you to give us a raise, that's not a human rights issue. I mean, you can imagine a way, I guess it could be, but uh, it wasn't, in this particular case, it, it wasn't presented, like it was, it was a whole bunch of, um, you just have to fit it into one of the grounds. For human rights issues, right? Uh, similarly, if they what they were raising was a concern about health and safety, then maybe the health and safety legislation prevents them from being fired for that. Or if they're complaining that the employer is violating overtime rules, then you can't be fired for for um, you know trying asking your employer to comply with the statute. But none of those things came up in this case. All it was is the employees said, "We would like to bargain with you as a group." Not through a union, just as a group, and they were fired. Um, and so, if there was a human rights angle to it, it didn't come up in the, in the case I read. Right? But sure, if, if they're firing you because you're all you know, because of your ethnicity or your religion or your gender, um, then you have a human rights cram. But we're talking about situations where it's that's not what's going on. What's going on is they're being fired for acting collectively, and no statute protects them. Which is a whole a gap in our legal system. That's going to be okay. Well, that's a good point at which to wrap things up. It's exactly two o'clock, so please thank, join me in thanking David for the talk. <laughs>